Good morning, everyone. So this is uh, day two of this uh, outstanding conference. Uh, today's, this morning's program is entitled uh, Paradigm Change Part 3, Can We Learn to Clinically Control Follicular Recruitment? Um, we have five speakers. Um, no housekeeping issues to bring up, so we'll just get started. So uh, our first speaker is Alexander Roskovic. Uh, he is from uh, University of Pittsburgh, uh, McGee Women's uh, Research Institute. Uh, Alex. Hi, good morning. and. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, thank the organizing uh, committee, Dr. Gleischer and Dr. Albertini, for uh, inviting me to this uh, symposium. And I see you have a great lineup of speakers, and I'm actually happy to be part of that uh, lineup. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, follicular genesis, and especially the embryonic origins of uh, follicular genesis, and uh, some of the uh, actually, new findings related to uh, the fact that also differentiation in meiosis, which occur uh, at uh, the same time in the female, uh, are actually separate and controlled by a number of transcriptional regulators. So the objectives of actually today's talk is uh, to understand really that OSI is a multitasker that has to deal with OSI differentiation and meiosis. There are a number of factors that actually are involved in this very early establishment of the primordial follicle pool. The, the interplay of meiosis and uh, transcriptional regulation determines a lot of the loss that occurs actually during early follicular genesis. And I will provide you uh, some evidence uh, where we think that these two transcriptional regulators, SULA1 and SULA2, actually are the universal regulators of both oocyte uh, and uh, male germline differentiation. Now, of course, we have to uh, review where these germ cells come from. And it's really a big journey. Uh, the uh, germ cell pool is induced by uh, bone morphogenetic protein factors here in the epiblast very early on. And this actually is a mouse. And most of the stuff I'll be talking is actually in a mouse uh, model of our studies. So the BMPs uh, will induce the formation of a pool of cells that will then become primordial germ cells. They will migrate to the gonadal <coughs> bridge. Uh, and at the gonadal ridge, depending on the sex, you either enter meiosis or you don't. If you're a female, you will enter meiosis and arrest uh, at meiotic stage one, uh, while if you're male, you'll wait for this to occur in puberty. And the rudimentary understanding of this is that retinoic acid actually it seems to play a role, and that high amounts of retinoic acid activates triate to be turned on, which then in turn uh, leads to meiosis in female, while in the male the striate is turned off and upon puberty, retinoic acid rises and leads to uh, uh, meiosis. So unlike the male, the female is a multitasker because it arrests in meiosis one and it has to uh, differentiate uh, until ovulation occurs. Now, if you actually look at the structure of oocytes during early gonadal development and prior to the establishment of the primordial follicle pool, the uh, oocytes actually exist in these uh, what people call clusters or cysts, uh, and uh, Pepling and Spradling actually have uh, modeled this after Drosophila, uh, where nurse cells, uh, instead of uh, these oocytes clusters, uh, nurse one oocyte that's going to become uh, the dominant one. But if we have multiple uh, oocytes that are linked together, they're intracellular communications, and these cysts do break down, a lot of the oocytes are lost, and only few uh, that survive, about half of them, form the primordial follicle pool. And this actually is what uh, this looks like. Uh, if you actually look at the 
uh, clusters. Now, this is Tessie's also has its own clusters of germ cells. Uh, this is embryonic day 15.5. This is two days after the onset of meiosis in the mouse. This is a newborn ovary where you have a number of cluster of oocytes. And these actually are individual primordial follicles now formed after the breakdown of these uh, clusters. Now, we and others have shown that these early stage of follicular genesis is transcriptionally very active and that a number of very important genes are <coughs> synthesized and transcribed and proteins are synthesized that play an important role, not actually only uh, in uh, driving this whole process forward beyond uh, primordial follicle, uh, but also we have a number of factors that are being synthesize uh, in this early follicular genesis that have implications for oogenesis and also early embryogenesis. And here in red uh, are shown a number of transcriptional regulators that appear to be uh, mostly oocyte specific as far as we know <coughs> in their action and expression. And then there are somatic factors that also play an important role in this early process of follicular genesis. Now, if you look at this from the aerial uh, anatomic viewpoint, uh, here are the primordial follicles, and they synthesize all <coughs> these proteins that are important for fertilization and early embryogenesis. And we also know that the environmental factors can affect this primordial follicle pool, uh, and therefore the, the milieu in which women's ovaries are uh, in, uh, basically um, exposed to can have effect also on the offspring of the embryo. And there is a lot of studies on diabetes and all that stuff that show the importance of oocyte exposure to these environmental agents. Nonetheless, uh, it tells you how important these early steps are. And the question is, well, is actually meiosis, which happens at the same time that oocyte differentiation is occurring, is it uh, independent of, uh, uh, of oocyte uh, differentiation? So uh, Dr. Page and his group have shown, and again, as I mentioned before, this factor striate is important in initiating meiosis. When a striate is knocked out, and this is the knockout uh, set of figures, this is a wild type set of figures, and uh, I'll just translate what this means here, is that basically when you knock out striate, the uh, chromosomal alterations and configurations that you see in uh, entrance into prophase and other stages of meiosis do not occur in striate deficient oocytes, uh, while of course they occur in the wild type. And although striate knockouts lose a lot of the oocytes, there are some oocytes uh, that are still uh, present in these ovaries and they can be super ovulated and they can be even fertilized and they arrest of course at the second stage, at the two cell stage embryo because uh, of the fact that meiosis never occurred. So uh, these embryos are not going to go anywhere. But nonetheless, uh, based on these experiments, they hypothesized that um, striate controls entry into meiosis, but there are other factors that actually control the differentiation. So we hypothesized that some of these factors could actually be these transcriptional factors that we uh, studied postnatally. And we actually discovered a number of these transcriptional regulators uh, that play an important role during early follicular genesis. Uh, these are all, SO1 and SO2 are helips to helip transcriptional regulators, which play an important role. Uh, <coughs> these are specifically expressed only in the oocytes and only in the female ovary. And we know that helix to helix transcriptional regulators in general are involved in uh, regulating tissue differentiation in other tissues. Um, of course, different genes. Now, we have also shown, uh, and others have shown, that mutations in these genes can cause uh, ovarian um, failure, uh, and it uh, uh, means that they are also important for human gonadal development. A subset of women with uh, primary amenorrhea uh, have mutations in, in these genes. If we look at the expression of these uh, uh, two molecules, they pretty much have identical expression. Postnatally, they're co-expressed. So these are uh, adult uh, uh, ovaries here showing, uh, uh, this actually is RNA showing the speckled signal of RNA expression on the rim of the ovary. And interestingly enough, they're mostly expressed. This is, of course, the uh, immunohistochemistry 
showing the brown signal, they're mostly expressed in a small primordial follicles uh, and are not really expressed in more advanced follicles. And the same pattern is for Sula too. If you, so we started, we wanted to look at the embryonic expression to see what uh, do they do in the embryo. And in the embryo, before the formation of the primordial follicle, they are <clears throat> significantly expressed, uh, beginning actually at day 15.5, that can be visualized by immunofluorescence, but not by Western blot, and then relatively abundantly at E16 and beyond. And then we have Sula 2s that are expressed as early as C12.5 and beyond. So they're not expressed at the same time. Um, so we wanted to take a look and see what is the interplay between these molecules in the embryonic gonad using whole mount uh, immunofluorescence. And so this is a whole mount immunofluorescence on the uh, embryonic mouse ovaries. And if you actually look at Sula2, already by A15.5, almost all the germ cells express Sula2. Now you may not appreciate this, but most of the Sula2 at this point in time is cytoplasmic. Uh, and uh, as you can see here, at E17.5, uh, newborn ovary and postnatal day uh, 7, actually, it becomes much more punctured because it is now in the nucleus. The translocation from the cytoplasm to the nucleus occurs with expression of Sula1. So all the cells that express Sula1, beginning here where a few cells we see uh, appear to express Sula1, uh, if you actually look at these cells, uh, that express Sula2, all the Sula2 are now translocated in the nucleus, and that's what basically happens uh, in this early gonadal development. That Sula1 appearance uh, causes translocation, although it doesn't mean that Sula1 actually is the cause of this translocation, but there is a correlation with that. And this is very uh, nicely illustrated here when you knock out Sula1 and you remove actually this protein. Uh, uh, you can see here in the wild tab where Sula2 is all nuclear, uh, in the knockout, actually, it is all now cytoplasmic. And it's telling us that uh, this actually indeed plays an important role. It's, it's expression for the translocation. So uh, what is the interaction between these two molecules? Well, they do have a physical interaction. If you do co precipitation, as shown here, it does show that these two proteins physically interact. Uh, and later on, in later stages of development and postnatally in primordial follicles, they are co-expressed in almost all of the cells. And if we look at the uh, knockout phenotype of these uh, individual molecules, Sula1 and Sula2, uh, and this actually is a wild type showing progression from newborn where you only have really germ cell clusters and some primordial follicles, and then one week where you have starting to see some primary follicles, uh, and, and, of course, seven weeks is when the puberty hits the mice and you have all, all sorts of follicular structures. And when you look at a knockout, uh, by the time of puberty, you really don't have any oocytes left. They're all uh, gone. Uh, and the phenotype, though, between the single knockouts as well as the double knockouts is totally identical, uh, which surprises because we thought that maybe the two will have synergism and therefore the, the ovaries will be much, uh, you will have a much more severe defect. But if you look at RNA um, uh, sequencing and, and arrays, you basically find out that the expression profiles are very similar, uh, which argues that these two are probably in the same pathway. And because they physically interact, they're, they're, they're required, therefore, for the effect on oocyte differentiation. Um, and and there, therefore, that's why we don't have a synergism uh, in the phenotype, and that's why it appears that the RNA profiles are very similar between the single knockouts. We also have double knockouts, uh, RNA expression that shows very similar patterns. So what we wanted to do then is we wanted to see, okay, well, can we rescue this uh, loss of oocytes by expressing Sula1 and Sula2 at various stages of embryonic gonad development? And we wanted to, of course, ask the question, because we know that meiosis begins at E13.5. Um, and uh, we still don't know whether these molecules do affect meiosis, and maybe that's why you have all this loss of follicles, or are they acting independent of meiosis? So if they're acting independent of meiosis, you would expect that rescuing the phenotype at E15.5, or even actually at later stages, uh, that you'll be able to 
uh, rescue fertility in these animals. And uh, what we did is we uh, created actually this transgene. There are two transgenes. Uh, one expresses SULA1 uh, under conditional control, and one expresses SULA2 under conditional control. So we can add this onto the knockout background and uh, express these at various time points, of course, dependent on the kind of crease that we have in our hands. So this thing we had is DDX4 Cree that allows to express the D15 and one later on. And so when we actually expressed uh, SULA1 on the knockout background at E15.5, and this actually is SULA1 knockout showing no germ cells, when we express the SULA1 at E15.5, we do actually see a rescue of uh, folliculogenesis, and we do actually see uh, fertility uh, that is, of course, not present in, in, in the knockout. It's in a single knockout, but in the rescue at E15.5, we do see that the fertility is restored. So that's telling us the rescuing postmeotically SULA1 expression will actually rescue fertility in these animals. Now, we did, we're not able to rescue SULA2, uh, SULA2 knockout with SULA1, and that's probably because when we look at the expression of SULA2, in the rescue animal, we don't see its expression. So uh, then we wanted to uh, actually uh, see whether the SULA2 uh, transgenes can rescue SULA2 knockouts. So now we're talking about the other one, the one that's expressed earlier, SULA2. And when we tried actually to rescue that one at E15.5, uh, this is the pure knockout, this is the attempted rescue. We are not rescuing anything here. And uh, the reason we think that's happening is because SULA1 is not expressed uh, when, we ex when, we, uh, when we try to rescue with SULA2. And then again, as I said, SULA1 and SULA2 physically interact. So we think that uh, uh, its non-expression is what's a no-go in this particular model for the rescue. But more interesting, actually, was the fact that if we actually express SULA1 knockout at P3, so this is postnatal day three where primordial follicles are forming, uh, a vast majority of follicles are presumably arrested in the uh, diplotene stage of uh, meiosis one. Uh, what we find here, and this is the knockout, and this actually is a rescue of postnatal day three, uh, we actually find that we do rescue uh, fertility. And uh, although the f uh, primordial follicle counts are diminished, uh, significantly in these rescued animals, uh, they, their fertility pops per litter and, and litters per month actually are rescued. So uh, just to summarize this, therefore, we have uh, that SULA2 uh, appears first, then SULA1 appears for unknown reason, although we have some evidence that retinoic acid plays a role in, in the expression of SULA1. Uh, the, its, its expression is correlated with the translocation of SULA2 into the nucleus, uh, and that uh, we actually could rescue uh, fertility uh, by expressing SULA1 either at E15.5 or even later. So we wanted to ask, well, what about all these other regulators that we know exist? How are they actually behaving in relation to these two molecules during the embryonic gonad development? Well. Uh, if you look at the expression pattern of various molecules here, this actually is triate that initiates meiosis, and this is SULA2 uh, that is expressed. And then uh, this actually is uh, uh, SULA, uh, this is, let's see, so SULA1 expression is in the red right here. So that appears around E15 or so. And the molecules such as LHX8, uh, FIGLA, and NOBOX are very much co-expressed. Their, their appearance is, occurs at the same time that SULA1 appearance <coughs> occurs. Uh, we also know that actually SULA1 binds LHX8 promoter, and uh, therefore LHX8 appears to be downstream of that. We also know that knocking out uh, LHX8 causes actually ovaries to um, uh, be atrophic due to the loss of germ cells, but it does not affect male gonadal differentiation. And uh, Nobox is another gene that we know when we knock it out, we actually have loss of uh, uh, follicles uh, and oocytes. So we want to see what is the relationship in the embryo. In the embryonic gonad, 
Uh, as you see, looking here at E16.5, when Sula 1 begins to uh, uh, appear, if you actually look at the expression of LHX8 and Nobox, they also appear at the same time that Sula 1 appears. And at E17.5, this co-expression uh, continues, um, and a newborn ovary, of course, most of the germ cells now contain these factors, uh, and they're all co-expressed together. Well, what happens uh, when we look at the embryonic gonads that have deficiencies in SULA1 and SULA2 and SULA2 double knockouts? Um, and uh, if you actually look at this bar graph here, uh, this is the bar graph uh, where the gray means uh, the percent of co-expression between the various uh, transcriptional regulators. Uh, if you look at SULA1 knockout, LHX8 is still expressed, albeit, albeit less than the wild type. Uh, but if you compare whether all the germ cells that express LHX8 also express uh, Nobox, we find that there are many germ cells that would express Nobox but not LHX8. So there is a disruption in the co-expression of these transcription regulators in addition to the diminished number of germ cells that express it. And this is clearly visible here too. Now when we look at the meiosis uh, in, these, uh, uh, in these actually knockouts, and these are chromatid spreads at various stages of meiosis from leptotin to diplotin. Uh, the uh, morphology is uh, preserved. Uh, we do RNA-seq looking at the expression of various meiotic genes. They do not seem to be perturbed. And meiotic genes that have been shown through knockouts to actually lead to loss of phocytes and uh, early follicular loss of phocytes, uh, MSH5, DMCA1, SPO11, and so on, they're all actually unperturbed. So what we think is going on is, uh, again, as I said, that um, uh, as SULA1, SULA2 is translocated nucleus, SULA1 and SULA2 physically interact, and there is, a reappear or there is appearance of the other transcriptional regulators that then regulate some of the downstream factors which you have previously shown. Now, why do I say that this is actually dimorphic action? Well, LHX8, Nobox, and Figla, when you knock them out, they only affect female uh, oocyte differentiation. They have no effect on the males. But we have previously shown uh, that SULA1 and SULA2 coordinate spermatogonia differentiation also. Uh, because when you knock out SULA1 and SULA2, you get these empty seminiferous tubules. Uh, the brown uh, label dots here is the PLZF, which is a marker for spermatogonial stem cells. And with BRDU, uh, these spermatogonias are actually proliferating uh, showing us that, uh, that these uh, spermatogonial stem cells continue to proliferate, but they do not differentiate. And we know that SOX3 uh, uh, is downstream or, or affected by SULAs, and GFR alpha 1 is uh, down regulated. Um, and we think this could be part of the mechanism by which it leads spermatogonial differentiation, but it is different than what you see in the females. So, so we think that this is, uh, uh, these two molecules play a role both in male and female uh, differentiation, but via different uh, uh, pathways that we currently have to, uh, are working to uh, unravel. Now it's important to know that both meiotic factors and, 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 and a number of other factors do play an important role in, um, uh, in human cases of gonadal failure, such as primary amenorrhea. I mean, when we sequence actually 35 individuals with idiopathic um, ovarian failure, uh, we find about 31% a cause, uh, and many of the genes such as MCM9s, uh, LMNA, RAC8, HRS2, they actually are involved in DNA damage repair and uh, in uh, um, meiotic and mitotic processes. So DNA repair genes do play also a very important role. But um, what I was trying to show you here is the two pathways do appear to be uh, independent of each other. So um, in conclusion, um, we believe that we have shown data supporting the fact that uh, OSA differentiation can occur independent of meiosis and that SULA1 and SULA2 actually play a very important role in this particular process. Uh, and that uh, this in many ways drives actually the early stages of follicle formation, primordial follicle formation. Uh, 
So <coughs> I would like to thank a number of individuals that have actually participated in these studies, uh, which have taken, of course, a number of years. And again, thank you very much for your attention and for your invitation. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, time for at least one or two questions. I'll start first. Alex, I have a question. Yes. So, um, so the Sulu 1 and Sulu 2, what do you think they're doing? Like, are there transcription factors causing Alexate, Figla, and Novox to, like, does it bind to the 5 primate, or is it acting as a scaffolding protein that brings it all of these uh, factors together? So we know that... Um uh, well, we don't know whether they work uh, together. We have done some um, immunoprecipitation in mass spec trying to identify what the what is the physical interactum. Uh, but LHX8 and Nobox uh, do not appear to be down, uh, do not appear to physically interact with these uh, molecules. Um, so whether this is uh, purely uh, we do know that Sula 1 uh, is able to bind LHX8 promoters, so presumably it could be activating it um, at the same time. Uh, we don't have that evidence for Nobox. So I don't, I, I, I'm not really sure they physically interact, um, but, and I don't know whether there's uh, retinoic acid or other signaling that goes on that actually stimulates their uh, appearance at a similar time. Um, but it clearly is an interesting correlation uh, that they all seem to be co-expressed with the appearance of Sula 1 and with the translocation of Sula 2. And we are attempting to, to actually look at um, uh, you know, ChIP-seq and RNA-seq of various Sula negative and Sula positive at those stages to really see what actually is happening. Now, of course, I haven't mentioned the somatic factors. We know a number of somatic factors that play an important role during these differentiations, the wind pathways and Fox L2s and all that stuff. But we don't really know much about how the oocyte uh, regulates this, and that's why I emphasize the, the role of the oocyte in this, in this journey now, whether it actually communicates back to the soma or whether it's just totally driven by the soma, uh, that also uh, remains to be uh, determined. So what happens to LX8 uh, expression in the knockout animals? It is diminished uh, by uh, actually more than 80%. But as you can see by immunofluorescence, there are still some germ cells that do express it. So it's not a uh, total off. Yeah, but the expression might be because you're losing the germ cells. It might not be because you're losing... No, no, we, the, uh, the number of germ cells remains the same. Okay. Uh, the number of germ cells is preserved. So okay. even a newborn ovary, when you actually look at these uh, ovaries and you count uh, oocytes, the numbers actually remain the same. So they can tolerate the loss, uh, but uh, postnatally, um, uh, perhaps uh, out of the womb, uh, they just lose the ability to survive. Hi, Alex Rushans in Edinburgh. Thanks very yeah, much. Yeah, how are you doing? Um, I just wanted to pick up on your very last slides. Um, you highlighted the possibility of DNA repair being involved here. Do those factors, uh, are they involved in um, recombination repair as well? Yes. Recombination? So then that would give a very plausible out pathway outside classic DNA repair. I was wondering if the sub two are getting a bit confused here. Yeah, so um, I wasn't going to um, get into this, uh, but... Uh, you know, there is quite a body of evidence from genome association studies that the age of menopause, many of the molecules involved <coughs> happen to be involved in DNA damage repair pathways. Mm -hmm. There are also, if you look at the, uh, and you know, whole exome sequencing has been actually very nice for uh, actually discovering uh, new players, uh, especially in case of hypergonotropic hypogonadism, uh, primary amenorrhage and so on, has shown a preponderance of meiotic factors. And again, thank you very much for your attention and for your invitation. Thank you.